Morning, everyone. I'm Phil, for those that don't know me. Name tag tells me that. If you'd just like to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 8. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Saviour was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favours. When the angels had left them and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found both Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. This is the word of the Lord. We're now in our third week of our series looking at some of the great Christian hymns that we sing at this time of year. Now, I found preparing this difficult compared with a normal sermon, um, and when I fronted Bernard about that, I got lots of sympathy. Um, <laughs> he just said, he did it to stretch me and it'd be good for me. I hope and pray that the result also builds up God's people. Let me pray for us, all of us. I need it, and you do too. Lord in heaven, we thank you for the songwriters that we've had throughout history who have brought your truth to us in words and music. Lord, uh, as we sing, help us to be wise, to discern your truth. But, Lord, when there is truth, please bring it into our hearts. As we look at this song today, Lord, please bring your truth into us and build us up in it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if you remember back to week one of this series on Christian songs, when we look at O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, if I was to give you a one-word summary for that song, it would be yearning. A yearning for release from our sins and their effects on all our relationships. But most importantly, a yearning for God to send the promised one and to make things right between us and him. A deep yearning of the soul in this broken world. Last week we looked at Hark the Herald Angels Sing and I'd summarise that song with the same word Bernard used a number of times, wonder. Wonder that the incarnation of God was even possible. Wonder that the creator of the universe could take on flesh. Wonder that he could be a man. Wonder that the time of promise fulfilment, the time of God's peace initiative had come. Now last week in that song we also sang of the worship that is due to Jesus because of the peace that he brings. Peace between God and man. He was born to raise the sons of earth. Born so that men could be born again. Yearning and wonder. Now this week's song is O Come All Ye Faithful and you probably guess from the children's talk that the main theme, the word that would sum up this song 
is adore or adoration. Now, the songwriter uses um, the event of the angels singing the passage I read from a minute ago. It's a particular time and a particular place in his history. And the chorus in the song urges us again and again, come and adore him, come and adore him, come and adore Jesus. So let me define, give you my definition of adoration, slightly different, pretty much the same. To me, adoration means a deep, heartfelt, loving approval and appreciation for someone or something. Now, importantly in that, it's of the heart. The mind might be involved, but it's not just mental or logical. Now, if you think back to the Lord's commands, the Bible says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. That's adoration. And we heard in Psalm 84, I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. They're the words of somebody who adores God. Heartfelt worship. No hollowness, no falsehood, no holding back. So it's a whole of heart thing, and therefore it can be overwhelming. So where it is directed is important. When it's directed to the wrong place, the consequences are awful. The theme and content of O Come All You Faithful is adoration. Now, the origin of this hymn is uncertain, probably written in the 1700s by an Englishman working in a French college. All the earliest copies bear the name Francis Wade. Probably initially written in Latin. Well, it was initially written in Latin. It was then translated by another Englishman, Frederick Oakley, working in Oxford around 1840. And he translated the verses we use today. There are a number of other verses... We don't usually sing those. They were translated later. And they contain more of the Christmas account. So let's have a look at some of the many truths in this Christmas favourite. The greatest truth and the truth at the core of this song is who Jesus is, his identity. He is the king of angels, a heavenly king. He is true God of true God. He is light of light eternal. He is the Son of God the Father. He is begotten, not created. Now those words are taken almost directly from the Nicene Creed. Verse 4 reflects John 1 when it uses the phrase word of the Father to describe Jesus. The God who did not let the confines of a young woman's womb the restrictions of becoming human stop him from being born as a weak and helpless child. The God whose plan to save a faithful people for himself included this immense, this wondrous act of humbling. He who created the universe confined himself in a few human cells. That's the wonder we heard about last week. The rest of the song all rests on who Jesus is, on his identity. Jesus is all of those things I've just mentioned and more. Unlike the first two songs we have looked at, O Come All Ye Faithful does not actually mention the work of Christ in redeeming a people or bringing peace between God and men. Its focus is almost solely on Jesus' identity. And it is who Jesus is that makes the invitation to come and behold him so meaningful. It is who Jesus is that leads the angels to sing and to praise God. 
all that Jesus is, is important because it makes what else happens in all of history and in this song appropriate and right. It is who Jesus is that brings forth all the emotions we'll look at shortly. But before we do that, there's a second major truth this song puts before us. And it's not immediately obvious. People are invited, and it's particularly the faithful. As the faithful see and hear the coming of the Jesus, they're invited to come and rejoice. Come and rejoice in the coming of God's Son and in what God has done. Come, the words repeated over and over. Come all ye faithful, come and behold him, come and adore him. Now this invitation to come is a communal invitation. The summons of the faithful in verse 1, the greeting of the faithful from the last verse is not I, it is we. It's all communal. It's God's people gathered happily, joyfully, coming to greet their Lord. It's what's offered to the shepherds around Bethlehem. The faithful are actually being invited to come and sing with the angels, to come and sing with the heavenly host. Glory to God. Glory in the highest. What an invitation we have. It's sort of similar like to the... Bernard's told us about the songs of ascent in the Psalms where the people sang as they went up to the temple. Here are God's people, there to be singing as they come to meet their Lord. We're celebrating. God has become man. The long-awaited one is here. The one prophesied from the days of Eden has come. God's plan has moved closer to fulfilment. The Messiah, the Lord, has come to earth as human. The I am, the almighty, holy, all-powerful one, can now be seen and touched. What is our response? The right response is worship. Worship and wonder. So what emotions does the birth of this particular baby at this particular time bring forth? I've already mentioned the happiness and rejoicing of God that God's people are to display. But the writer also urges us to triumph and exult in Jesus' coming. Those words sound strange to our ears, triumph and exulting, now have overtones of self-congratulation. This triumphant feeling is much closer to what the word triumph originally meant. Originally, a triumph was a celebrating procession that a Roman general was given when he returned to Rome after winning some great victory on behalf of the city. So the general would parade through the city with the people celebrating the victory that he'd won. And he'd won it on their behalf. They actually did nothing to cause the victory. They did not fight. They did not risk their lives. They just get to celebrate. So the word triumphant is very fitting here. The faithful who come to Bethlehem are triumphant, not because they have done anything, because God has done this marvellous thing. He has come. The King of Angels is born. So what is to be our response apart from adoration? We are encouraged to sing, to sing our adoration. Do what this song itself does. Sing like the angels, with the angels. What a choir. The earthly host and the heavenly host united in one great song of praise. Glory to God. Glory in the highest. The singing and exaltation, the joy and the triumph of the faithful, the call to come and behold what God has done and to greet him happily and joyfully, 
These are all right responses because Jesus is God. I've already mentioned it, but there is another theme which runs right through this song alongside adoration, and the two are tied together. I've already noted the call to come. The first verse and the chorus are out. Repeat that. Come, come, come. Come and behold him who is the king of angels, God in flesh. Come, let us adore him. These words might be the invitation that the angels offer to the shepherds to come and see the baby as Christ the Lord. They might be the words that the shepherds say to each other after hearing the angels singing to the glory of God. Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Come, let's go. They might be the words of the shepherds when they are making known the saying that has been told to them concerning this child. Come, let us adore him. The disciples too, when they first met Jesus, were often asked to come. Follow me. And then when they saw their friends, their friends, they said, come and see. Just as we heard Philip say to Nathaniel, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. What did Nathaniel say? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Come and see, Philip answered. Come and see. The Samaritan woman beside the well also said, Come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Jesus himself said, If anyone thirsts, let him come and drink. God is not stingy. The invitation to come is everywhere in the Bible, in many different settings. It originates with Jesus, but it flows through his followers and those who meet him to so many others. This song invites us to come and adore him, Christ the Lord. If our hearts are full of adoration for Christ, we too, like Philip the disciple, will say, come and see. Come and adore. This is him, Christ the Lord. If we adore Christ, we will want to invite others. If we adore Christ, others will notice. You know when you meet a couple who are deeply in love with each other after many years of marriage. It's part of them. Shows in everything they do. Is it obvious in us, in everything we do, that we adore Christ? Now, I'm sure you've heard the phrase, I am passionate about. It's used too often these days. In my view, it's become meaningless. But whatever you think of the phrase, and I'm just a grumpy old man, um, it should be true of God's people in relation to Christ. Here we are at this time of year with the most amazing miracle and the most amazing good news to take to the world. If we adore Christ, we will not be able to keep silent. We will have to speak. Come, let us adore him. Come and see Christ the Lord. Give all glory to him, born this happy morning. What's the greatest invitation you've ever received? Could you stop talking about it? Our world is full of bad news full of stories of people who have been ripped off or people who have missed out. Yet here in this song, we are all invited. 
there is an invitation which reflects the invitation repeated throughout the Bible to come to God and worship him. Many seem to have trouble with this thought, to worship. Many seem to adore all sorts of other things apart from the one person who we were made to adore. <coughs> we were made to adore. All are invited. No one who has recognised and responded to the invitation that is Jesus has missed out. I'll say that again. No one who has recognised and responded to the invitation that is Jesus has missed out. We rejoice in him, we exult in him, we are happy and triumphant. We adore Jesus. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honour and power and might be to you, our God and Saviour, forever and ever. And all the people said, Amen. Amen.